Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this first meeting of the planning committee for the 2023-24 municipal year. Um, can I start off by uh, asking for nominations for a chair? Is there, are there any nominations for chair? Rochelle? So Rochelle nominated David. Is there a seconder? Al? Thank you. Are there any other nominations? No, in which case uh, David Cornish is elected chair. I, I know David's online, but as, as you're online, David, um, I'll take us through the second item, which is the uh, appointment of vice chair. So same procedure. Are there any nominations for vice chair for the municipal year? Al? Uh, do I nominate Andrew? You can nominate Andrew. Is there a seconder? Rochelle seconds. Any other nominations? No. And so therefore, Andrew will be the vice chair. So, Andrew, if you'd like to move next to me and uh, if you can take us through the rest of the agenda, please. Good evening and welcome to this evening's meeting of the Planning Committee of Working and Borough Council on the 14th of June 2023. This meeting is being held as a hybrid meeting with seven committee members present in the room and one online, while some officers are attending the meeting in person and some connecting via Microsoft Teams. The meeting is being live streamed on YouTube. My name is Councillor Andrew Mickleborough. In the absence um, uh, of the chair in person this evening, I as vice chair will chair this meeting. The planning committee is consisted of nine elected borough councillors who are supported by a variety of professional officers. This is a quasi-judicial committee with formal set procedures which must be adhered to. Firstly, the planning officer will present the application and then only those speakers who have registered to speak will be invited to address the committee. No one else, including borough councillors, town and parish councillors, agents, applicants, objectors or supporters, are permitted to address the committee, ask questions or disrupt the meeting. Everyone has had the opportunity to comment on each application through the consultation process. Please note that there is a strict time limit of three minutes per category of speaker, those being town and parish councils, objectors, supporters, and those borough members affected by the application. Members of the committee are more impressed by the quality of what you say rather than how long you speak for. But above all, please yeah. stay within your time limit. Town and Following the registered speakers, Members of the committee will discuss and debate each application and seek clarification from the council's professional planning officers in order to try and reach a decision. The decision reached by the committee may or may not agree with that recommended by the presenting case officer. Finally, it is the committee's responsibility to determine any valid planning application presented before it using current national and local planning policies and relevant decisions of the relevant planning inspectorate. Our role is not to suggest alternatives to applications, nor to consider whether they are a good idea, whether they are needed, whether they are too costly, or whether there are alternative uses of the site or more suitable uses of land elsewhere. If you are joining us remotely, please ensure that your camera is switched on only when you are speaking and that your microphone is unmuted only when you are speaking. Thank you. Agenda item three, um, Callum, apologies. Thank you, Andrew. We've received apologies from Councillor Bill Sohn. Uh, Councillor David Cornish is attending virtually, so he won't be able to vote, but he will be able to participate. Thank you, Callum. Um, agenda item four, minutes of the previous meeting, which was held on the 10th of May. Is there someone um, uh, uh, who was in attendance at that meeting uh, who would like to propose 
that those minutes be accepted as a true and accurate record. Okay, Wayne, and a seconder, Rachel, thank you very much. I will sign those minutes, uh, so we need to vote. Those people who were in attendance at that meeting, if you support um, those minutes, thank you. That's unanimous, I think, amongst those who were present. Thank you. I'll sign those minutes um, at the end of this meeting. Um, item five, declaration of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? Thank you. Item six, any items to be deferred or withdrawn items? Uh, none, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay, so moving on to agenda item seven, 221797, Crockers. Um, before we go to the case officer, Ben Hindle, just a reminder that this is an outline planning application that was deferred at the last meeting to allow a site visit to be undertaken to facilitate a better understanding of the context of the site. All nine members of this committee attended that site visit, including to two adjacent properties in Bochief Close and Baton Close on Friday the 9th of June. And if that could be included in the minutes, please. Okay, um, so the case officer, Ben, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. This is application 221797 to Crockers, and this is on Rushy Way within Lower Early. Now, this is now an application, as the chair has kindly clarified, with all matters reserved, and this is for nine dwellings to replace the existing single dwelling. This outlines the site's location within a very major development location, as we can see by the surrounding built form. Now, as briefly clarified in the previous slide, this is located off Rushy Way, which is a quiet residential street with traffic calming measures, which have been introduced a little bit further up from the application site. Zoomed in ever so slightly, we can really see that this is quite an extraordinary example within a major development location and quite an anomaly, and that it's a very large property on a very large plot. And if we look at the surrounding form, that's more true to the major development location to which it is located. So as last time, I think it's very important to um, set the parameters for what we are approving, what we are considering, and what officers have worked together to uh, look into. Now, this is an outline application where you only are considering the principle of development, the quantum of development, and now in this case, this is for nine dwellings, and whether the site can accommodate that, which officers really think it can. Also, by default, the broad access location is approved. However, details, as I mentioned last time, it may committee, um, details of your width, length, visibility, and highway safety, that is reserved, and a matter reserved to be considered at a later submission, which leads us on to the next point here. So I think it was um, very important to, um, to clarify that reserved matters are like to this outline application. It can be listed by members of the planning committee. It can be considered by residents in exactly the same way and also scrutinized by officers, which is um, absolutely expected with every submission of this type. Now, I briefly touched on the access and the parameters of what we would be considering within the uh, reserve matters to follow. But along with access, we have layout. So you can think about your plot size, the garden depths, residential amenity, and scale, which is another reserve matter. And that concerns height, size, and housing tenor. So what will we actually see on the site? External appearance, which pertains to design. And finally, landscaping. And that's where all of the TPO matters, the existing trees and landscape features, and uh, the hedgerow, uh, which is very important to the site at this current time, um, will be considered. So for those that um, of the uh, in the audience that weren't uh, benefiting from attending the site visit that we had last Friday, this really outlines what the application site is. It's a very large plot and it's a very large dwelling. So the picture to the top of your screen is the front elevation of Crockers. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, that's the rear elevation with uh, a TPO, which is actually intertwined within the patio, is uh, is is, um, is featured, and you can see that obliquely there. So the access, another point of contention, and received lots of representations to this regard. We have the internal views to the top of your screen, and at the bottom, we have the external views. This is a closed board fence, and this hinders visibility into the site, and if you didn't know it was there, you likely wouldn't. These CGIs were used last time. Essentially, what it shows you is the surroundings, the density, and what can be really expected of a major development location. And we can see to the um, on the picture on the bottom, we can see the neighboring uh, Bochief close houses and uh, the very high density there. 
when we compare that to the indicative site plan, which is shown here, the density of the proposal, even though we must note this is solely on an indicative basis, the site promotes large plots, which are larger than that surrounding. So as I mentioned again, the uh, matter is hot or reserved, so this is an indicative site plan. And therefore, this is purely to show officers that the site can accommodate uh, nine dwellings, which this plan does. There may be some minor variations to be agreed, but that is outside of the remit of this application. That will follow a reserve matters application, and that is absolutely owed to its nature as an outline with all matters reserve, which is an entirely valid application. The application is recommended for conditional approval. The conditions are outlined within Appendix 1 of the committee report, because, of course, at the moment, the LPA cannot show uh, without question a five year housing land supply. Officers are then needing to apply the tilted balance. And what we have is a scheme that puts a net increase of eight dwellings forward, nine dwellings in total. And the indicative impacts, which are shown at this current stage when weighed on balance, do not outweigh the benefits of eight more houses uh, within the borough. Now, there are two minor updates or points of clarity, which I think is very important to um, to mention. So we've mentioned this before. It was the last time supplementary agenda, but to drill this home, landscape is a reserve of matter. We have outline condition 10, which stands for tree protection. By appending these conditions to the outline, this will well inform the following reserve matters subject to approval this evening. And landscape features that were lost, they will have to be mitigated against. And that will be considered by our trees and landscape officer, who is a professional, and this will then be weighed on balance by officers. The second point is the um, just to acknowledge the objections that have been received to date. Now, a lot of these objections, um, not to say that they are not valid and not very solid representations, they per se, they absolutely pertain to reserve matters stage, matters such as your landscaping, your access, and those comments will absolutely be welcome, subject to acceptability of this application. However, we must remain in the remit of what an outline application is. And it, again, is an entirely valid application. And um, those comments would be appreciated, subject to approval, but they are not largely um, pertaining to the outline nature of this application. Uh, thank you very much all for listening. And uh, any questions? Okay. Thank you, Ben. Uh, we have four registered speakers, the first of whom is Caroline Smith, uh, representing Early Town Council. You have three minutes to speak. Good evening. At your last meeting, I spoke as a ward councillor against this application and asked the committee to carry out a site visit so the context of the site could be fully appreciated. This request was for various aspects such as traffic, highways issues, environmental elements of the mature trees, wildlife and fauna on the site, the privacy and immunity currently enjoyed by the joining residents to be understood. And thank you for doing so. It is much appreciated. Tonight, I'm speaking on behalf of Early Town Council's planning committee. This committee's recommendation are that this outline proposal should be turned down for many reasons, all of them fully referenced in the planning matters as clearly detailed in your document. What is the fact that we need to build more homes, especially affordable ones, for expanding population, but they have to be the right homes in the right place? This application is neither. Please bear in mind that the original application for the site was 11 dwellings, which would have made this a major development with strict information requirements and a clear application for application of affordable homes. A major issue that this application is only indicative. If passed, what will be settled to reserve matters may be very different. It could be nine three storey units, which would impact overlooking and major increases in a number of occupants and hence vehicles. I would like to highlight that the Highways Department raised 19 major concerns with the original application, mostly due to missing information, and I cannot find anything on the planning portal to indicate that these have been adequately addressed and Highways now have no objection. I'd also like to highlight that WBC drainage raised a major concern about surface water drainage. And there's no indication of how this guidance in section 167 and 168, the National Planning Policy Framework, be followed to avoid flooding at number 23 and 25 Bow Chief Clove. I'd also like to say that there are seven trees to TPOs and no information how these were protected. And indeed, the officer's report indicate one or more of these will need to be failed. 
and it is difficult to understand the comments that the biodiversity, and particularly the wildlife, will not be affected when something like 65% of the current open ground will be built on or concreted over. I noted in the office report regarding the balance that the 2.8 affordable homes will not be provided and there will be a loss of trees that have TPOs, but apparently this is not harmful. How can that be? We desperately need 407 affordable homes per year for the next 13 years, as stated in your papers, and we need to keep what diversity we already have, not destroy it. I truly do not believe the committee should approve this application without a great deal more detail. If minded to do so, set very firm conditions that must be met under reserved matters, particularly a limit of nine dwellings. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, next is Sandra Shaw. And I believe that Sandra has a PowerPoint presentation, if that could be could be loaded. When you're ready, Sandra. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Good evening and many thanks for carrying out a site visit. Um, the paperwork constantly states that this is an area of major development. That is incorrect and totally out of date. It was in the 80s, but it is now fully developed and cannot sustain the infrastructure to support more further major development. We can only comment on plans and information available. We realise that this is matters reserved, indicative, outlined, as mentioned, 16 times in the summary document, documentation. We do get the hint, but we can only comment on what we can see and what we've been given. We're trying to portray why we don't feel the site can accept nine dwellings and why it is an overdevelopment. That's why we're here. Um, <clears throat> As Stephen Conway stated and other members echoed, it is unfortunate that this is outline only as it would facilitate the principle of development in absence of detail and essentially be signing a blank check. We wholeheartedly agree with that. Obviously, we, the residents, um, are most concerned with the detail. Um, access, as we said, only the broad location is approved within the submission. So the current access is for one dwelling. Anything more than that could not be accommodated due to the TPO 1 and 2 and the 25 square metre root protection order. So the widening of the current access would not be suitable. Again, as iterated by Caroline Smith, when it was a 10 house proposal, working in Borough Council's team were critical. Next slide, please. Um, and required a new junction 30 metres from Tiptree. So why does a very minor reduction to nine houses make the access widening to five metres acceptable? Loss of TPO trees, surely to warrant any approval, this should indicatively show how they will plan in outline to retain all of the trees in the TPO and not remove some of them or potentially harm them. Hardscaping landscape, appearance, garden space, site level space, runoff, they have to be considered in the development, surely, indicative or not. Um, three storey dwellings, next slide, please. Um, hopefully you were able to see that there were no three storey buildings surrounding the site, so any new three storey houses would be out of keeping with neighbouring properties. Biodiversity loss, no sensible person can tell us that cutting down trees, stripping topsoil, demolishing a house and not protecting the mature hedgerow is a good, sensible or reasonable idea. Surely this all runs counter to Working Borough Council's policies on climate change, biodiversity, development in gardens and enhancement of the local environment. Press shows there was an article on the 2nd of June 23, more than 40,000 trees have been planted in Working and Borough Council as part of the Council's ongoing effort to promote. Sandra, I'm afraid that your time is up, so you need to finish there. But thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you for your thank time. You. Next to Daniel Thompson, uh, Thompson, the agent, and he's on Teams. Daniel, thank you. Uh, good evening. Can, can you hear me, please, for not being in person? I'm quite aware of it. Am I being heard? 
Hello. Hi, Daniel. You're I'm not sure how good your connection is. Try turning your camera off just to see if okay. that will help with the bandwidth. Is that better? It's not great. Uh, um, do you have a different second. connection you could try? I'm going to try Dave, so just give me a second. Okay. No, it's Wi Fi. Uh, just let me know if it improves. I think that, that's slightly better, Daniel. Okay, I'll, I'll try. And I'll, I'll go slow, so I, you know I, I might not. I might run out of time. Um, if I may, I make a start. Yep. Um, so as as introduced, this is an outline application. Uh, to submit an outline planning application, three things are required as a minimum: site location plan, site block plan, proposed site plan. The level of detail is kept deliberately small to make this a viable application for applicants to establish the principle of development. So whilst I admire the passion of all the objectors, these are all matters, as explained at the beginning, for the reserve matter stage. They are not matters for consideration today. They are not information that we needed to prepare for this application. That being said, we have prepared additional information we provided a design and access document. We provided supplementary comments following in excess of 50 comments to this application. And we also showed on the site location plan and the proposed site plan exactly which trees would be affected of the TPO trees and how we would provide a biodiversity net gain for those protected trees in a two for one replacement. We have also shown, contrary to national planning policy, that we will be providing three, uh, two to three affordable units in line with the borough's policy, as I said, in contravention to the national planning policy. So we have gone beyond our requirements on this site. Previously at the past meeting, a uh, personal comment was made about the perception of outline applications and how they're not a good application. This is a perfectly legitimate type of application. And if there is any prejudice towards the type of application, I ask it not be included in the consideration of this outcome. It shouldn't affect the way we decide our application, whether we like the application or not. And, and that was noted in the minutes at the last meeting. And it was brought up again by one of the representatives. It is not a matter of slipping in an application without any details. It's establishing a baseline a maximum amount of development and we have worked closely with the planning department to achieve a site that came in at 11, has respected the protected trees and brought the number down to nine, provided affordable housing and dealt with highways at this level of application satisfactor satisfactorily. I thank you for your time and I'll gladly take any questions. Thank you, Daniel. And finally, Pauline Jorgensen, ward member. Thank you, Chairman. Ready? I recognise that this is an outline application, but I have serious concerns that when it moves to full application, the proposed number of dwellings, which is the subject of this application and sets a baseline, as the applicant said, will be an issue. The planned access doesn't meet highway standards, being almost directly opposite the entrance to Tree Close, rather than the required 30 metre offset. It also appears to be very narrow with no pavement. I can't see how cars will pass each other or refuse lorries will access the site. Whilst access is a reserved matter, the landscape officer has raised concerns regarding the loss of TPO trees, such as T005, when the access is widened, which it will have to be for a drive serving one dwelling to one serving nine houses with significantly higher traffic level. I would also like to mention to the planning officer that Rushy Way is not a quiet residential road. That's why it has calming on it. The area already has significant issues with inconsiderate parking and speeding traffic due to the proximity of Hillside Primary School. And it's essential that correct visibility displays are maintained and sufficient parking is provided for residents. The site is cramped, doesn't provide public open space, leaving residents with unattractive, largely hard standing frontage. Three of the gardens, plots nine, one and six, do not meet the required standards, and I don't see how a longer garden for one plot can mitigate another plot having a short garden. 
The space and length standards are there for a reason. It's no consolation to the resident with inadequate length plot or other people they overlook that somewhere else on the development has a long garden. It's essential that the new existing hedging is retained to screen the site from neighbours, especially as new developments will be raised. I'm also very concerned with the existing two-storey houses in Bochief are not subject to runoff from an area which is higher with so much hard landscaping. It's also essential that houses are not overlooked by these new dwellings. In summary, it's clear that the construction of nine houses is too many for a site which is cramped, has inadequate access and does not meet highway standards. The proposed access is unacceptable, and although development is only outlined, it is clear that the number of houses precludes any improvement to access and will result from the unacceptable loss of mature trees and hedgerows. The number of houses is not um, a reserved matter. The number of houses will be decided tonight. The construction of nine houses will give access both to new residents, access issues both for new residents, but also for refuse and emergency vehicles. It is wrong to give a developer permission to build nine houses on a site that cannot sustain that number, and I would ask the committee to refuse the application. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Are there members of the committee who would like to speak? If I could just get names first. Okay. Al. Michelle. Michael. And Wayne as well. Okay, there will be an opportunity for others um, to join that list. So, um, firstly, Al. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, could I just apologise because I, I, I completely slipped my mind, but I did declare an interest in this last time. And so I think I should um, this time as well. And it's in the minutes, um, what I said, because one, because I'm a ward member in Hillside, although that, in fact, I'm told by train doesn't actually matter, but but also because I'm an early ta town council planning committee that um, considered this. Um, and but um, as I was say, said last time, um, I will be approaching this meeting with an open mind. Thank you for that, Al. OK, that's noted. OK. Uh, do you have any questions um, or comments at this stage? Thank you. Um, Rochelle. There was a mention of the amount of uh, contribution to affordable homes. Would that uh, contribution of 170 something odd thousand pounds, would that actually buy one? Or would it actually be able, would that be enough to be affordable to build one or to buy one to actually do that? I'm just curious because we want to see that it's affordable homes also, but it's not enough money. And I've got a second question as well uh, about the five year land supply. Uh, there's been multiple different um, inspectors' uh, opinions about whether we have a five-year land supply or not, and it seems to be still up in the air from what I gather. The last one said, yes, we do, and then other ones have said, no, we don't. Do we actually have one, first of all? And second of all, would these houses help us get the five-year land supply that we need so the developers can't go wild and build every place they want. Okay, Ben first. Thank you very much. Uh, just in regards to the first point, I think there may have been a little bit of um, bit of confusion with affordable houses. Um, as far as officers are aware, there is nothing to secure affordable houses on the site because the National Planning Policy Framework uh, last updated in 2021, um, they do not require or recommend affordable housing for units uh, under 10 on a site. And this is to support this is to support uh, small scale house builders to leave a little bit of slice to buy for the little guy. And um, I think there may have been a little bit of confusion on that, but this application does not put forward any affordable housing as far as I'm aware and officers are aware. Point two, we cannot demonstrate a five year housing as plan at this time. Um, a dwellings is significant enough to tilt the balance uh, for permission of this scale, a net gain of eight, that is. It is a shame that we can't actually have affordable homes in all developments, but the government has been otherwise. OK, uh, let's not make any political statements uh, tonight, please. OK, do you have any further questions at this stage, Rochelle? Thank you. Uh, Michael. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, it's very interesting, worthwhile site visit. I found it very, very useful and appreciate everything that um, that the speakers have actually mentioned about it. But I just wanted to know, because there's been certainly in the objections from that people have sent in about the impact of, of the level of buildings, height of buildings. And I know that on page 39, item 89, that the proposal must demonstrate that the development of nine dwellings um, 
can be accommodated without significant impact on residential properties in terms of overlooking, overbearing and loss of light. And obviously that is something that's been mentioned just a moment ago. I'm just really wondering um, what sort of impact the development could well have. It's a shame in some ways it's outlying um, because we can't go in reserve matters that would get a lot more detail. Um, but I just really wonder what officers can say about that, please. Thank you. Brian, if you could, uh, sorry, um, Ben, if you could respond to that, please. Yes, absolutely. Um, as the scale and the design is not fixed, it's very difficult to predict neighbouring amenity impacts. For example, in officer's opinion, three storeys may not be appropriate, four storeys may not be appropriate, five storeys may not be appropriate, it is a reserve matter. And uh, that cannot be considered based on an indicative site plan. If these were two storey dwellings, if the hedging was retained, for example, do you think there'll be any significant overlooking in in informal way based on the indicative plan? The um, the answer is no, but we cannot consider this uh, until the details come through a reserve matter stage, because at the moment we only have an indication of what the scale is being proposed to design the layout on site. So calculating neighboring mini impacts is very difficult at this stage for officers to do. Michael? Yeah, a little bit confused by that. I mean, it's saying in here at this stage the proposal must demonstrate. That's what I'm really getting at. And is it demonstrating that? This is what it says in the agenda. So I'm a little bit confused by that. If you could explain a bit more, please, Ben. It is really quite simple. The um, the scale has not been confirmed. The height of the buildings have not been confirmed. And therefore, as an officer comparing this against to the guidance within the bar design guide, it's it's near impossible. Um, again, based on the indicative layout, this is not something we can offer at this time, but that's something that will be really scrutinised at reserve matter stage. And um, reserve matters aren't by default approved. They must be acceptable on grounds of neighbouring amenity. Officers will not be putting something forward and recommending approval for something of, um, of that nature. There's unacceptable on neighbouring amenity grounds. It simply would not happen. But at this stage, that is not a matter that we are considering in any great detail. Um, can I just go back to Rachel's point? Uh, page 34, bullet 40, 45. Am I reading that wrong? The last paragraph, it says, for a proposal of this scale, comma, 2.8 units and a contribution of 35% would be required to be secured as affordable in the first instance. That's correct. You, you're absolutely correct. Um, however, also within the report, it's acknowledged the fact that in recent appeals, inspectors have ruled the fact that our requirement within CP6 is out of date and therefore the national guidance somewhat prevails. And that is the overriding advice within paragraph 64 of the National Planning Policy Framework, which states the fact that on proposals for under 10 dwellings, affordable housing is not or should not be sought after. But there's nothing to stop in this committee from, from pushing that button, is there? Absolutely not. That's a risk-based exercise based on um, the recent appeal decisions we've had, yeah. which unfortunately that has been overturned when we've refused for that reason. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I just want clarification because it was a flat no, and now it's a maybe. It's, it's a risk-based exercise. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll, get, I'll get the risk. Fully, fully, um, fully weighing here on recent inspector decisions and the outcome for WBC. Yeah. Um, so that's that's how I'll answer that point. Oh, but that, I, I get the risk, but that just bit of clarity to your point, Rachel. Um, so let, let's go back to highways then. Um, it, I, I think we saw um, Phil Milburn on site, but I see Gordon's here tonight. Is he the one who's going to help us along? Yeah, yeah that's okay, great. So the entrance and this 30 metre offset, when we were on site, um, the highways officer said we would have to looking at the site from the road facing the site, you would have to extend it by about a metre. Now, I'm not going to get into levels because there's a whole new thing, but I do agree with what's been said this evening. The levels on that site are very interesting. And as you as you, if you look at the entrance, um, the driveway on the on on the map. I'll tear this up. On the map. And as you drive in, potentially this cuts away and the dip, I would imagine the height from there to the bottom part of the the uh, site is I would say in excess of three meters um so I know we're not discussing the actual entrance but it was recognized on site that 
um, some of the vegetation, the trees on the left would have to be uh, removed, correct? Again, indicative, but likely yep. yes. But very, yeah, a yes or a maybe. Um, and this 30 meter offset, which as, as um, Councillor Jorgensen says, is contravening highways policy. Could Gordon answer that for us? Yes, yeah, yes, I can. <clears throat> and I apologize for not being on the site of it. Yeah, we'll last, last week, uh, I had another another appointment I couldn't get out of. Uh, when you're looking at a junction as a, as a proper marked out junction, like Tiptree Cloughs, with yeah. white lines and everything else, yes, you have to have the 30 meter offset. However, when you're looking at this as a which would be a private access only. So it wouldn't be designed like a, you know, like tip three close. We felt that, and, uh, and according to Manual of Streets 2, which actually states that the need for and provision of junctions on new highways and additional junctions should be assessed in the round, such as the need for access at a particular location, the impact, etc. We looked at whether the access could be moved, but the access couldn't be moved because of the impact on the bus stop and the bus layby. So, <clears throat> having talked to you know my colleagues, we looked at the, there's a, the principle of access in this location. That's all this outline is, is the principle. Uh, and with the conditions I've I've recommended regarding diesel design, visibility displays, moving the lamp column, uh, road safety audit, etc., as part of the reserve matters. And I ask him. Um, thank you, thank you, Gordon. Um, so you you mentioned the word private. So yes. I know it's reserved. So we're assuming this this entrance is not going to be adopted by the highways authority. That that is that is our assumption we've taken. Yes, mm. it'll it'll be like a the the pavement part will be adopted, but behind that is more than likely that it will be a private. Right. So they bring all their rubbish out onto the highways, then so no refuge will go <laughs> no, into the, the site. The, ref, the refuse should be able to enter the site as well. OK, so that, that's Wayne, if you're comfortable with this, I'd like to probe this issue um, of the 30 metre offset um, a little further. Um, and thank you for your attendance tonight, Gordon. But um, my first question in relation to this is what is the reason for for requiring, usually requiring a 30 metre offset? What are the reasons for that? that the reasons being so that to minimize the interaction between traffic between one minor junction and another minor junction so it's not treated like a a, a straight ahead priority junction are there is there any guidance as to the um when uh, the 30 meter offset actually um, begins to apply. I mean, it seems as though in this instance, the reason for not um, potentially not requiring this um, is because the access would be described, is being described as a private access rather than a roadway. So is there any guidance anywhere, you know, as to what qualifies under what situations the 30 meter offset must be applied. Well, according, according, oh, I got according to Manual for Streets 2, it does state that the need for, as I said before, and provision of junctions on new highways and additional junctions on existing routes should be assessed in the round, considering a, a wide range of factors. And also looking at the potential for interaction between adjacent junctions. When we're looking at this this site, which say 
nine houses, you're looking at, if you look at our trip, uh, approved trip rates, you're looking at somewhere about five vehicles coming out in the peak hour compared to a higher number on Tip Tree and a higher number on, on, on Rushy Way. That was, that's what we felt that this is, not a, this is not a junction, this is just an access. Thank you, Gordon. Are there any members who would like to probe this specific issue any further? OK, are there other members who would like to ask questions? I certainly have some questions, but I'd like to take others first. So Rochelle, Wayne, any others, please? Stuart. Okay, Rochelle. I'm just curious whether a bin, lorry, if a bin lorry could actually get down that road when another car coming up. I know that may not be the thing, but I'm just curious. And or if a bin lorry stops on the side there in the front and they bring all the stuff out, what kind of effect would that have on the traffic? OK, Ben, could you just comment on that? And is that pertinent to tonight's discussion for the outline application? I do believe so. If we um, if it does pertain to traffic measures, though, Gordon might be best to answer. If that's OK, Gordon, would you mind jumping in again? Sorry to grab you, my friend. That, that's not that's not a problem. Um, as part as part of the reserve matters, the width of the axis is important to ensure that at least two vehicles can pass each other. If, for exa example, uh, uh, the refuse vehicle can get in but collect rubbish from the outside, there will need to be a bin collection store by the access so that people can collect it. It happens once a week like everywhere else in the borough from the high from the highway Michelle i'm not sure the attractiveness of having a big bin street okay. nine dwellings in the middle thank of the you street. okay wayne um i'll come back to that okay. um can we just have some clarity what do we regard this this area to be now I know it was at one point the biggest housing estate in Europe, but that was 30 years ago. What 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 is the definition of the site now? This is a uh, it's previously previously developed land within a major development location. Okay, um, I'm now going to go back to affordable housing because the gentleman, when he the agent, basically said they will be providing um, affordable housing. So um, we've now got the agent saying that, so it wouldn't be so much of a gamble. I think that's reasonable. I think we actually, um, the agent is happy to uh, provide that subject to viability. I think we can um, amend the recommendation to be subject to conditions and, um, and a section 106 legal agreement for affordable housing. That is the first, um, first we've known of this, unfortunately. Um, and I'm, I'm now gonna come back to the, the topic before I go on to landscape, and I know it is reserved matters, but um, can we just get a bit more clarity from Gordon? I mean, it does concern me, uh, and I know this is only outline, but you're going to try and get two vehicles in that entrance, even if you increased it by a metre, which was, is, and the the site levels as you go in towards the, the left, it's, that is going to be almost a, a very steep slope. But can I just have some clarity over on on an unadopted drive? I didn't think refuge lorries went down an, on a, an unadopted drive. So the only option they have got is to put their refuge on the main, vir virtually bordering on the footpath, which would be a well very unsightly. But I just would Gordon know that, or would you know that, Ben, or who would know the answer to that? Oh, sorry, I'm just saying, um, in terms of unadopted, I understand it, as I understand it, you, refuge, our refuge trucks don't go down unadopted because of the liability insurance. Is that correct? I don't believe so. Uh, there's several examples in the borough. I'm thinking of one in Wargrave, Baxedines is uh, it's unadopted, yet refuge lorry is still access. Um, so no, I don't think that's the case. I 
I beg to differ because I've I've always understood by um, a previous officer that if we went into unadopted sites and there was an incident, we would be liable. But um, we do it on a goodwill gesture. But so I, I, I beg to differ on that. Um, and I'm still concerned about this this entrance. But I think I've pushed it as far as I can. I do see that Daniel Thompson has got his hand up, but um, we would normally not. Um, so it's up to you. If you want to make a short point of clarification, it's up to you. OK, I'm advised that if you'd like to make a short point of clarification, um, uh, we're happy for that to happen. Uh, thank you very Daniel? much. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. It's um, orthodox. I just wanted to say that on the 13th of March 2023, via email with Helen Maynard, the original planning officer, I did agree to affordable units, uh, namely the front facing units to Rushy Way. Uh, if that helps provide clarity, we discussed this uh, a number of times. Um, whether we would follow national planning policy or the borough's planning policy. And it was decided by myself and the applicant that we would follow the borough's policy, offer two as requested uh, by the affordable housing officer. I just want to provide that clarity because we've had all three answers tonight and there is only one correct answer. Thank you, Daniel. That is very helpful. And it um, uh, confirms um, the possibility um, of us, should this outline permission be approved, um, of attaching a, an additional condition uh, relating to the provision of affordable housing subject to viability. Thank you very much for that, Daniel, and also Wayne. Um, Stuart. No, that answers my question on the affordable housing as well, too, Chairman. Thank you. Michael. Yes, thank you. Just really following on from um, Councillor Smith's point about um, the access. Um, dust carts, I, it's a very narrow gap even when it could be extended to take a little bit on that left-hand side where the trees are and moving a lamppost as well. Um, that's a very tight corner. If by any chance that the dust cart can actually access that road and go down there, which is steep as we all know, um, it would have difficulty trying to turn around, I would imagine. So more than likely, the rubbish... Um, bins, whatever they are, will be left on the road. And I'm also worried that um, that could be hindering access of pedestrians and, and um, by prams, chairs, walking, whatever, um, could be a very, very dangerous aspect. So I'm just really wondering what officers can add to that. Thank you, Ben. So, uh, so yes, uh, essentially, as Gordon's hinted at earlier, there are um, solutions to this. Uh, so by way of an example, having a bin store, a communal bin store right next to the access, uh, that is a common solution that we see uh, where access is impossible for refuse vehicles. And this essentially means that the um, the employees, the waste collection employees, they can run out, they can grab the bins and, um, and it doesn't impact uh, highway safety. It doesn't leave bins on the road. It's an effective solution and this would be secured via hard landscaping details. I mean, it, I, I don't wholeheartedly agree with that, but also we've got um, a school nearby. Um, there is traffic that goes along there. Um, there is tra traffic, new traffic car. I mean, it's been put in, it's, it's been moved a bit before um, outside the school. So I think it's going to hinder the traffic trying to get there um, by a lorry. It's not going to be there for, say, a couple of seconds and on. It's going to be there for quite some time as the rubbish is actually loaded onto the back. So I still think that will be a huge um, impact on the roads around there. Any further comments on that specific issue, Gordon or Ben? Well, thank you, Michael. Um, I'd like to take a slightly different tack with a, um, a small number of questions. Um, and it's about process. Um, if outline permission is approved, um, could officers please summarise the process by which the detailed plans would then be drawn up, including what sort of interaction there would be between WBC and the applicant to address residents' concerns, for instance, regarding the exact position and the size of each home? Yeah, um, a very, very good question indeed. Um, that will be considered by the applicant working with the officers. As we've seen with the reserve matters, they need to work. And whether that is compliance with the bar design guide, which is our planning guidance for separation distances and neighbouring amenity, details like that can be considered at this reserve matter stage. 
uh, afterwards. And this relates to exactly the same as building size. Um, if the site cannot accommodate it, it's not something the officers will accept. Thank you. Thank you. And a related question. Uh, could you please explain what opportunities there would be for residents and other stakeholders to comment on detailed proposals should this reach the reserved matter stage? Yes, absolutely. Um, reserved matters, they're I like to outline they're subject to public consultation. So uh, so those neighboring surrounding, they will be receiving neighboring notifications and uh, in which your comments will be absolutely welcome and will be considered. Thank you. Um, if this was uh, the outline permission was to be granted um, this evening, I for one would want cast iron assurances that in this instance, a reserved matters application would come to the, this full planning committee. For the benefit of all those with an interest in this application, could you please explain and could we please have minuted the process by which this would be assured that it would return to this full planning committee? Now, under the scheme of delegation, um, reserve matters actually don't need to come to the planning committee. However, as we've had express interest within this application, that's something that could be listed by any member at absolutely any time. And I'd be more than happy if I'm the case officer or to instruct the future case officer to send a summary of the proposals uh, to ensure that members are uh, happy to uh, to send this to planning committee, a reserve matter stage. But there's absolutely the scope to do that. I like to any application that's submitted. Thank you. Brian? Thank you, Chair. Is it um, possible just to clarify um, the affordable housing discussion a little bit with a bit of background context as well to some of the things that uh, councillors have heard um, from uh, officers, the agent uh, and discussions? The um, original application that we received was for 10 units and a 10 unit scheme uh, is required by our local plan and by national policy to provide a percentage of affordable housing. The scheme was subsequently amended, um, sorry, and two, two units of affordable housing were proposed at the time in order to meet our policy and national policies requirements. The scheme was then amended to nine dwellings to fall below, it would fall below that threshold of 10 units um, for affordable housing. So therefore nationally wouldn't require affordable housing. Locally, our local plan still requires it. However, as members will note from the committee report, recent appeal decisions on developments between five, ten units um, are often unsuccessful at arguing for affordable housing um, if refused on that basis. Now, no financial viability appraisal was submitted with this application for nine units. The agent was, the applicant is at liberty to provide as allowed for by our local policy and national policy to show whether the scheme is viable if the amount of affordable housing is, is, is provided. That wasn't required, uh, so that wasn't provided and officers deemed because it was um, seeking affordable housing where national policy did not require it and the amount of affordable housing was so little for us to insist upon a financial viability appraisal would mean we would have to be prepared to defend a refusal against nine houses for not providing affordable housing. When, as members will note from the agenda, everything else from officers' perspective was largely acceptable for us to recommend approval. So fundamentally, it comes down to the fact that officers in advising you as committee are not prepared to refuse this application for not providing affordable housing. However, the agent correctly has said they are willing to provide to, and if members which are at liberty to you, you are at liberty to take the view that the scheme is only acceptable with affordable housing, it may then still be subject to a financial viability appraisal, and it may come out in the wash through the financial viability appraisal that actually it's not viable nine dwellings this site two houses okay now that's not been tested okay so we don't know what the site can financially accommodate in terms of affordable units and the council as officers are not prepared to re resist development on that basis for the reasons it included in the report i hope that's clear it's slightly confusing and you've heard a lot of different bits of information 
but ultimately the application without affordable housing to officers is acceptable okay thank you thank you brian i think that is very helpful but uh, can you just for, for clarity can you please explain whether or not you feel this committee um, could um, uh, add a condition requiring provision of affordable housing subject to viability understanding the risks that that uh, may entail the committee is at liberty to amend the recommendation if for example the committee move towards a recommendation of approval then that can be subject to additional matters but obviously securing affordable housing would need to be done as part of a legal agreement and that requirement for affordable housing whether it's two units whether it's one unit would need to be subject to viability we can't impose a quota um, of affordable housing on a site so it may well be a recommendation is similar to subject to affordable viability for affordable housing and if viable secured through a league agreement but officers would you probably need to delegate to officers to work on the specific wording because it's quite an unusual approach thank you uh rochelle is it on this point thank you would an informative be okay rather than a condition is that the uh, possibility and unfortunately not an informative has no legal strength and it just is an advisory to bring um a developer's attention to normally other legislation um, which falls outside of the planning process wayne i think we've been put in a very difficult position with this um i don't like it um and i don't like outline planning applications and there's there's loads of questions on landscape that i could go over that what was discussed on the site, especially on plot six and seven, where they've got roughly a three metre high beech tree, beech hedge along there. Now, I can't see any way where we can uh, we can um, imp uh, impose that that three metre beech hedge stays in place. I can't see that. And I think the back gardens, as soon as they get in there and they get loss of light, they'll be cutting that hedge down. So, uh, but we're in, you, we've been put in a very difficult position and and I think the only way out of it is we're going to have to scrutinise the reserve matters. Thank you for that, Wayne. Um, and you know I share uh, very very much your thoughts. Um, but I feel that um, we should now try to um, wrap up this uh, this discussion. Um, I would like to say uh, that I found the site visit to be extremely helpful. However nothing that i saw led me to conclude that it would be impossible to build nine homes in a compliant manner on this site it's important to note that uh, this is um, uh, in a sustainable location within an uh, existing urban area and that national policy supports the principle of such development however as i said i share many of Councillor Smith's concerns. And my support for this um, uh, proposal uh, would have to rely on the detailed plans submitted at the reserve matter stage, being able to satisfactorily address the concerns that many understandably have expressed about the proposal. These plans would have to be thoroughly scrutinized and would need to be recommended by the uh, committee um, for approval by um, at the reserved matter stage before any building commenced. I don't believe that there are any substantive grounds in planning law and policy to refuse this outline planning application. I would like us to um, request that officers work on wording um, for an addition condition that if this was approved, that it would be subject to uh, the provision of affordable housing subject um, to viability. Um, and I would like to, if that is accepted, uh, then I would like to suggest that the detailed wording um, of that condition um, uh, be um, um, uh, discussed with the chair and vice chair um, 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 uh, before um, it's formally adopted. So as I say, 
I agree with Councillor Smith very much. I empathise very much um, with um, um, uh, residents and also with the applicant as well. But um, I don't believe there are substantive grounds for refusing this application. And so I would like to make a proposal that we accept the officer recommendation subject to the condition stated. Sorry? It, it can be secured by condition. It's going to need to be uh, subject to a Section 106 agreement to secure the uh, the affordable housing subject to viability. Section 106. Okay, subject to a Section 106 um, agreement. Okay, so that is my proposal. Do we have a seconder? Tony, thank you. Okay, all of those in favour of this um, recommendation? Okay, two in favour, two, four, okay. Um, any abstentions? Two, three, four. Okay, and any against? One. It's carried. So that is carried. Okay, so the outline application is approved. Thank you. Thank you for everybody who attended in relation to this application. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, agenda item eight, um, application 203617, Riverside Park, Woos Hill. Uh, and again, the case officer is Ben Hindle. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. This is application 203617 to Riverside Park or Woos Hill Meadows within Woos Hill Wokenham. So this is a very interesting application. It's a full app to uh, reconnect a 340 meter stretch of the historic Paleo Channel. And this is to be diverted from the existing man-made channel along with your ancillary built form, which are your two foot bridges, a flow control device, the removal of a culvert and the silt removal and um, some landscaping works also. Now the application site is located within a major development location. However, the site itself uh, is a public open space, Woods Hill Meadows, and it has a very tranquil setting for being in a very busy part of the world. It's loved by residents for good reason. There are adjacent residential roads to the application site, but the works themselves will maintain around 100 meter separation distance at the absolute most and minimum rather. And these are Arthur Road and Brookside. To the west of the application, uh, sites we have Riverside Park, the Morrisons we know and love, and M View Close also. So zooming ever so slightly in, we have the majority of the work shown on this overall plan. So we have the existing channel, which is the left of your screen up there, and it's the light blue color. Now this is man-made, and there is one fundamental flaw with this among many. So if we look to the bottom right-hand corner of our screens, there's an existing weir at the top of the stream. Now this prevents aquatic migration and the fish simply don't have the angst and the humph to jump up the uh, the stream, unfortunately. So um, this then creates a degree of um, inbreeding because of course the genetic pool can't spread. So this unfortunately is contributing to the failing standard under the WFD directive for the Embrook and therefore something needed to be done and the Southeast Rivers Trust have proposed an answer through the re right. The, uh, the re-diversion and the diversion into the historic paleo channel, which is the darker blue shown on the right of the left-hand corner. Now, this is the natural channel. This is the direction and the flow that water wanted to go before pesky man intervened. Now, in order to achieve this, there is many small works, a significant project, as we can see through the large amount of uh, appendices, which I'm sure we all appreciate it, um, is a lot of work has gone into this over a high amount of years to achieve what is a very sound application on biodiversity grounds. Also shown at the point of diversion, we will have a flow control device which monitors the flow within the 
proposed channel or the historic channel, and any excess flow will be diverted into the existing channel, which in its own right creates an element of flood relief. Moving further onwards, actually one more point is the offline pond within the um, the Paleo channel. Now again, this is a point that was absolutely loved by residents, and again, for, for a solid reason. This was constructed, to the best of my knowledge, 15 years ago by Friends of the Embrook, and over time it has started to be loved by our frog population and spawn. Now, frogs are not species of principal importance. However, the applicant has certainly looked to mitigate this, as I will discuss moving forward. So, moving on to the actual built form on the application, there are two bridges proposed. This is the Southeast Rivers Trust Northern and Southern Bridge. One, this is for pedestrian enhanced access, but also for maintenance as well, because this will require maintenance. And these have been introduced because WBC will eventually be taking this on. And um, and this will be an efficient way for them to maintain the the um, the application site and the proposed works. Zooming in slightly more, we have the sections of the northern and southern bridge. Now these are constructed from a tropical hardwood called Eki. Now though this is not native, the applicant has kindly provided a uh, license number, and this is very suitable for the size ripper area and context. They're very durable at that, which again reduces future management issues for WBC in the future. As we can see, there's a 1 in 12 gradient, which accords and is in excess of the British standard, which means there are, will be inclusive access across these bridges. Moving on. These site surroundings, again, this is a very nice, tranquil, isolated location. If it had too many adjoining occupiers, it wouldn't be considered so tranquil, but it is. So to the top of your screen, you will see the pedestrian access, which hails from Brookside as existing. Now, this will take you through the various winding loops of public footpath through Riverside Park, Woosel Meadows. And, um, and currently, in multiple spots, there are bridges, there are culverts where you can walk over. To the bottom of your screen, you will see obliquely and view close and very obliquely to the left hand corner. This is Riverside Park. So there are neighbors as such. That's the, the relationship with the existing channel. However, none of which will be massively interfered with by the very nature of the works. Now, linking back to the provision of this offline pond. Now we are not removing this pond. This is not what is proposed today. This is be, being merely turned on as such, which means there's a flow of water going through it. Now, unfortunately, this will have the knock-on effect that frogs may not like it as much, but it will also provide a, um, a habitat which is suitable for lots of other examples of biodiversity. For example, the nine different fish species which was identified during the fish survey. Now, to mitigate this, even though there is absolutely no strict policy requirement, the applicant has gone above and beyond and has provided a, um, well, has agreed to enter into a Section 106 agreement. We've had lots of works with the WBC and, uh, and CERT. We've received the Memorandum of Understanding for the wider works and the pond itself, which is a, uh, an approval in principle of the concept. And this will be secured through a, um, for a bilateral Section 106 between WBC, the LPA, and the applicant. And this is to provide an application for the pond. This is to provide the actual delivery of the pond. And then the final term is WBC taking this on. There are lots of positives with this application, and um, but it must not be forgotten that there are always some impacts with development. So we'll start with the um, the less than desirable. So we do have the the loss by turning the offline pond is existing on. However, that has been suitably mitigated, and temporary noise impacts to be expected of any development. And in fact, this will be minor in the context of your normal house extension. Even the enhancements to biodiversity are significant. The the potential for flood alleviation and control. The increased aquatic permeability to um, to increase that gene pool, mitigation offline pond to be provided, enhanced connectivity and access, and one that's not on there is community cohesion. So this uh, project is supported by the um, by the Yellow Fish program. Now this educates residents, this educates people on what river river conservation is. This provides the perfect outlet for them to really apply that learning, as a lot of the works will be done by volunteers. So there are social, environmental, and potentially economic with the saving of uh, flooding uh, positives for this application. And therefore, I request members of the planning committee um, to recommend this application for approval, subject to the conditions listed within Appendix 1 of the report and the completion, as I mentioned before, of the associated Section 106 agreement to deliver that pond for those frogs. Alternatively, in the very unlikely event that the Section 106 is not signed within six months, on. <laughs> um, within six months, um, I request members of the planning committee to please authorize the head of development management to refuse the application. This time frame may be um, agreed slightly differently with an extension, 
And uh, this will be at the discretion of the LPA because this is a good scheme. Uh, there are no updates to the first one, so uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ben. Uh, we have one speaker, uh, Nick Hale, um, who is here in person. Hi, Nick. And I believe you have a PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. Second, Nick. When you're ready. Thank you and good evening everyone. Um, I'll start by saying a huge amount of work has gone into this project um, and it involves a wide range of partners, um, which uh, the aim and end goal is to achieve uh, bringing ecological and social benefits to this important site. We have engaged with a wide range of local groups, undertaking presentations, guided walks and a range of educa education sessions with local schools. We are fully committed to develop, develop delivering successful projects across the Loddon catchment, which includes this project on the Embrook. Um, sorry, I should have introduced myself, Nick Hale, Senior Project Officer from the South East Rivers Trust. Um, the, for those of you who don't know, the Rivers Trust is a nationwide um, charity. Um, next slide, please, Ben. That doesn't seem to be. Thank you. Apologies about that. I think my laptop might have frozen. Yeah. We're pausing the time, so don't worry. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Let's try that again, shall we? We had an IT person on on, a, on call for something, something like this. Um, that <laughs> give a sec. Just there we go. Give we have sec. this. Thank you, Nick. So we have it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, the Rivers Trust is um, independent um, organisations working under the Rivers Trust banner. So there's over 50 Rivers Trusts across the UK um, and growing all the time. Next slide, please, Ben. Um, we are South East Rivers Trust, so we work um, in the South East region, and these boundaries show all the different uh, river catchments that we work across. And you'll see the towards the top left, the Loddon catchment, which the Embrook is part of. Thank you, Ben. Um, so we have a mission to deliver outstanding river ecosystem enhancements through science-based action, collaboration, education, and engagement. Thank you, Ben. Um, so here's some examples of some of the engagement we do on site, getting people in the river and loving their river. Thank you, Ben. Uh, some education sessions. Um, our education session, sessions are generally maxed out throughout the year and they're really successful. Thank you. Uh, partnership and facilitation. We host catchment partnership meetings, so we uh, have a range of stakeholders across the catchments and facilitate uh, the works to be delivered in a sustainable and successful way. Thank you, Ben. Um, here's some examples of some river projects we've done. So weir removals, um, river restoration, uh, fish passage projects, um, all having ecological and social benefits. Thank you, Ben. Uh, here's some uh, background behind the Loddon catchment which the Embrook is part of. Um, so you can see the Loddon catchment boundary here. Um, the red arrow is the Embrook, um, which is a tributary of the Loddon, and the, that all flows into the Thames eventually. Thank you, Ben. Um, here are some key issues uh, that the Loddon catchment faces. Um, road runoff, silt, um, low flows, so over abstraction, uh, habitat deg degradation, um, to name a few. Thank you. Uh, here's an example of a successful project we did in Charville Meadows. Um, so we took a field uh, adjacent to the river and we created a backwater. Um, this was the backwater after uh, completion and um, following that we had a really successful uh, fish survey which showed exactly what we wanted to do. Thank you very much Nick for that very very informative presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Right. Um, do we have any member questions? 
Uh, Captain Michael, in a moment. Michelle. Michelle. Okay, so Michael and Rochelle to begin with. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I did actually enjoy reading this item, although it was somewhat um, difficult to read. I think lots of technical stuff in there. So uh, I did plow through it all. Um, I just really wanted to, to cut to the chase on one particular point, and I'm pretty sure it says it in here, that the it's kind of really realigning the Embrook to its original um, course. Um, that that won't make the flooding issue worse, i.e. I, either that part, or I know where um, Rochelle's ward is as well, has had a problem with the Embrook in the past. So it wouldn't make that worse, or or hopefully make it better, but certainly not make it worse. Ben? Thank you. Um, no, we'll definitely not make it worse. Um, this has been a really intensive project between CERT and the Environment Agency. I think it take, took around two and a half years to overcome their objections, but the modelling is absolutely spot on. The uh, the flood risk assessment, absolutely spot on. The exceedance flow, absolutely spot on. And having that secondary channel for excess flow to follow on to, it will have improvements and it definitely will not make anything worse. Okay. Yeah, I mean, certainly reading it as well, there's um, lots on our good friends, the bats and fish and trees and everything else. But just going on to the offline pool that you mentioned, um, and I'm sure already in here somewhere that that it could have newts as well. And I know that fish tend to eat newts, not being a bit specific, but this could happen to other animals. What sort of protections will there be for animals that maybe want to eat other ones? Uh, so essentially, our ecologist, who is the um, he's the the competent individual who would look through this, uh, he's considered all the surveys proposed, um, everything that eats everything, everything that is eaten by everything. Uh, to put it very technically for you, there, my uh, my apologies. And um, so, so essentially, um, there are protection measures that are going ahead, and the applicant is committed to uh, to ensure that the works do not impact this. And um, essentially, whether this be performing works outside of breeding seasons, the um, the surveys themselves, they did not identify any protected newts that needed any special consideration. And um, everything that requires mitigation, requires protection, has been secured within the approved plans. Yeah, so thank you for that. I mean, it's really a case of letting nature run its course, really. And I don't think we want to interfere too much into that. But thank you for that. And thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Michael. Rochelle? Two questions. One, there was a foul sewer modification there. Please tell me you're modifying it to run the sewage back to the southeast water. Uh, but uh, other than that, um, what exactly is that? And will there be a plaque put up? Because it, the reason this whole thing happened was because there was a mill uh, there. And that's why it was diverted to the mill. Can we at least have a plaque for where the mill used to be? That's not there anymore. And, thank you, Chair. Um, well, in response to the first question, which might be a little easier to answer. Um, so essentially, the existing pipe length is utilised for the foul sewer. Now, um, again, like with the Environment Agency, like with WBC, um, South East Rivers Trust have had intensive consultation with Thames Water. And the sewer design document, it clearly states three different options are actually selected, tested, and this was then presented to Thames Water of what would be the ideal or best case scenario. And option one was selected, and this is essentially leaving the, um, the existing pipe and then essentially adding a uh, connector with a further six meter piece of pipe. This will have a very similar relationship. It doesn't seem, you know, it sounds like quite a very, very large project. It, it, it isn't, and um, we're in capable hands with that. But Thames Water have considered, and they're happy, and that ensures that we're happy. And as Michael said, the ember goes through Winnish. Uh, we would like to have it clean and clear and not full of sewage. Uh, but that's something else entirely that we can't do in the planning committee yet, but I would like to see it anyway. Okay, point taken. Um, are there other members who would like to speak? If not, I'd like to make a few points. Firstly, I'd like to um, echo something that Michael said. Um, this was a very comprehensive um, set of reports and thank you um, for including all of the reports. You know, I think it is really, really important that we do have an opportunity to see um, them in their entirety. So thank you for that. Um, they don't appear to raise any intractable problems, um, and they do include and outline, describe um, many mitigating measures. Um, 
Going back to one of the questions that Michael raised about flooding, the modelling on page seven, uh, referred to on page 74 demonstrates the proposed scheme doesn't increase flood risk either upstream or downstream. Um, I note that the environment agencies withdrawn an earlier objection after working closely with the applicant. That's important. Um, I very much like Personally, the, uh, personally like the opportunity provided for volunteers um, to be involved in practical conservation works. And um, thank you, Nick, for including that uh, in your presentation this evening. And uh, finally, I note on page 184, the agricultural uh, report concludes that um, the application is of uh, low agricultural impact and thus acceptable. So I'm going to ask whether there are any members, firstly, who have any further questions, and if not, whether anyone would like to make a proposal. I'm just going to ask if... Yeah. Rochelle? Rochelle, want to... Is informative. Thank you, Callum. Yes, um, uh, you made a very um, uh, 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 interesting um, observation about the previous, uh, the history, you know, of the site, including the location of the mill. Would you like to uh, recommend that we include an informative um, that a plaque be erected um, to um, locate and possibly describe a little bit about the history of the mill? OK, um, do we need to vote on that? Yeah, so you yep. second that. OK, um, that, that would just be advising, um, sure. requesting the applicant consider it. That would be so sure. I wouldn't tie the applicant to anything. Yeah. No, no. OK, uh, do we have a seconder for Rochelle's uh, proposal for informative? Thank you, Tony. OK, um, so um, would some. Quickly. OK, so those in favour um, of adding that informative. Please raise your hands. That's unanimous. Thank you. OK, um, do we have someone who would like to, anyone who would like to make a proposal? Wayne? Microphone. Yeah, I'm just going back to the page. I was saying I suggest we, I recommend we approve the application as laid out in the officer's report. If you must. All of those in favour of approving um, um, uh, the, this uh, application. Thank you. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. And thank you for your attendance, Nick. Moving on, um, agenda item nine, um, planning application 230742, um, library parade, um, and Connie um, is the uh, case officer. Thank you. Uh, case officer, just take a moment to set up. Thank you, committee. Thank you, Chair. This application relates to Library Parade in Woodley. The existing two-storey building comprises of four retail units at ground floor and vacant office units at first floor. It is situated in Woodley Town Centre, an urban environment with a mix of architectural styles and building types. Planning permission is sought for the demolition of the second storey of Library Parade and replacing with a th part three storey, part four storey, upward and rear extension to provide 14 apartments comprising of nine one bedroom units and five two bedroom units. The building would have a maximum height of 12.4 metres and would extend the width of the existing building. Floor plans and elevations are shown on screen now. 
10 parking spaces are proposed, five spaces are retained for retail units and five allocated to the residential dwellings, two of which would be allocated as disabled parking. 21 cycle parking spaces are also proposed. Members will recall that a previous application presented to this committee in February earlier this year. Sorry, members will recall a previous application presented to this committee in February, February earlier this year for a similar scheme, albeit the application was for 16 apartments. The application was deemed acceptable in all regards other than in relation to neighbours at Sanford Court, which are the residential apartments above the Lidl supermarket and doctor's surgery opposite and you can see Stamford Court in the photo on the screen. There was concern regarding the 11 metre separation distance between the proposed third floor and Stamford Court being inadequate and having a detrimental impact in terms of overlooking to these neighbouring properties. As such, this previous application was refused following a member site visit with the full reason for refusal contained within the main report and also on the screen. The applicant has taken on board these concerns and has now reduced the scale of the proposal to provide a design that incorporates a 15 metre separation distance between the proposed built form and Sanford Court at, at third floor level. This complies with the recommended front to front separation distance in the borough's design guide. Furthermore, there are also no third floor windows that would face onto Sanford Court and privacy screens are proposed for third floor balconies to minimise the risk of any perceived overlooking. Officers consider that the design and scale of the development is acceptable given the very context of the surrounding area. Parking and highways matters are deemed acceptable by the highways department. Quality of accommodation and amenity space is acceptable, along with no substantial impacts on other neighbouring properties. These matters were also all accepted by the planning committee under the previous application, and details remain the same under this proposal. The scheme would bring 14 new apartments into an existing settlement, which would have social, economic and environmental benefits. These are outlined in the main report, and so is considered con to accord with the MPPF in terms of sustainable development. The dwellings will also importantly contribute towards the borough's housing land supply. To conclude, officers considered the sole reason for refusal of the previous application has been overcome and that should be the main focus in assessing and determining this application. The officer recommendation is therefore to grant planning permission subject to conditions and a section 106 legal agreement to so secure finan a financial contribution towards affordable housing and an employment skills plan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Connie. Um, we have two um, registered speakers. Um, the first, Bruce Chappelle, is unable to be with us this evening, um, so he has asked that I instead um, uh, read um, a statement from him. So this is a statement from Bruce Chappelle, um, a resident. Firstly, thank you for your time and the opportunity to have a say about my opposition against the development of Library Parade. I apologise for not being able to attend in person, but I thank the Council for alternative arrangements to allow my voice to be heard. I own and live with my daughter in one of the flats above the Lidl building, which is directly opposite Library Parade. I continue to voice my opposition to this development on the grounds of encroachment of privacy. The developer has made an attempt to negate the encroachment of privacy to my windows and patio doors which are bedrooms and a lounge, but has not considered my privacy when it comes to the use of my balcony. This is my only outdoor space and is used often. It is one of the reasons for purchasing the flat. The balcony is just under two metres in length, in depth, sorry, and as a consequence, when I am using it, I am within 10 metres of the windows on the proposed development. I exercise, I socialise, I sunbathe, I hang out my washing, etc., all on my balcony. This would be in clear view of the development. Just drawing a straight line in sight from one window to another is not a good way of ascertaining privacy and boundaries. People do not just look straight ahead. Draw the lines from all the windows to my balcony railing and you will see the issue of developing too close to an existing building. I will be able to look down and see into various rooms and they will be able to look up to my balcony 
outdoor space is so important to our health and well-being, and I hope that the Council protect my privacy so that I can continue to enjoy this space. Thank you for your time. We also have Joseph Baum speaking on behalf of the applicant. Joseph? Thank you and um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm here on behalf of the applicant, Hanslink, uh, which is a family owned development company that truly listens to what communities want. Uh, that isn't a company slogan. That is exactly what Hanslink has done here in Woodley with this planning application. Um, as your officer has kindly said earlier this year, the committee refused our application for 16 new apartments at Library Parade. Members considered that there would be overlooking to the neighbouring occupiers of the second floor south facing apartments opposite in Sandford Court. Uh, this was the only reason for refusal given the following uh, given following the committee's uh, deliberations, which included a site visit. Uh, we respected that decision at the time. We have listened and we believe that we have responded. We have reduced the number of apartments to 14 by taking away two apartments on the top floor. Uh, the remaining two apartments do not have any windows facing Sanford Court. Uh, as the officer's report says on page 337, bullet 57, uh, this scheme has now adequately overcome the reason for refusal for the previous application. The separation distance proposed would be, 15, be between 15 and 15.2 metres away from Sanford Court which well exceeds the separation distance sought in the council's guidance. The two balconies also include privacy screens. This is in keeping as the Sanford court flats have privacy screens between their balconies too. The reduced scheme has been well designed uh, and I would like to focus now on four positive reasons to support your officer's recommendation for approval. First is the location. There is more to it, of course, but put simply, this is a brownfield site in the town centre. This application maximises the use of this space and reduces the need for less sustainable applications that are not as well served by public transport. It promotes alternative travel, such as walking, and through the provision of cycle stands, cycling as well. And it also provides electric vehicle charging points. Second is energy efficiency. Again, put simply, the flats will reduce energy bills for future residents. Our energy consultant has advised that the flats will exceed the council's policy requirements and could achieve CO2 savings of approximately 65% over building regulations. In the current cost of living crisis, where we are all struggling to pay our bills, this is a welcome benefit for future residents. Thirdly, this is about places to live. In addition to keeping the independent shops that are already there, Hanslink is ready to deliver a total of 14 much needed one and two bedroom apartments, with two of them being wheelchair accessible. In addition, our application includes an affordable housing contribution of over £166,000. And despite the reduction in the number of units, this will make it still make a valuable and sensible contribution to the housing need. Thank you, Joseph. I'm afraid you'll need to finish there. But thank you for being with us um, this evening and also for your presentation. Now, before we go to committee members' questions, and we will um, begin with Tony as the ward member, um, I'd like to just make uh, note a couple of points, okay, to set the context. Um, I hope that members have noted information in the supplementary agenda. There is one correction and one clarification to the officer report. They seemed fairly straightforward to me. Um, as has been stated by Connie, um, uh, this is a new application following refusal um, of the application in February um, of this year. And the grounds for refusal were overlooking to neighbour neighbouring occupiers of the second floor south facing flats at Sanford Court. Although this is a new application, the committee should not need to go over matters that remain unchanged from the previous application. They were thoroughly scrutinised at that time, they're minuted and they can still inform any member's decision this evening. But um, we'll begin with Tony in a moment. Which other members uh, would like to ask questions 
or otherwise speak on this application. Any other members? Okay, Tony, would you like to, to ask any questions? Thank you. Yes, I, I um, think we should be appreciate the fact that the developer has, has uh, uh, taken account of our previous objection here and, and um, made uh, improvements so that uh, it's no longer looking uh, well now meets the the minimum distance uh, for the the uh, gap uh, overlooking Sanford court um, I, I think I, I hear the uh, objection of the your, your colleague which I think perhaps that um, is to be expected in 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 if one is living in a, a busy shopping area like that and that that's, doesn't seem unreasonable to me. Um, I did look at the, I, I realise this has been talked about before, I, although I wasn't present sadly, but, but the, the um, I note that the parking uh, is still going to be uh, under pressure there, that, that there's, a, there's uh, and the, the existing retailers uh, do have um, the existing parking. And I wasn't sure whether the, there was, uh, in the plan that they would have, I, I think they had some spaces, to, whether they have the same amount or not. I, are there enough for the workers there to, to be able to park? Uh, that is my only real um, re reservation on that, apart from that. I, I think that as the developer has has um, made improvements, I think we should, we should Thank you. Uh, Connie, could you address the parking uh, question, including, um, uh, clarity on whether there will be any allocated parking spaces for the staff of the retail units and also the residential units. Yes, so in total there'll be 10 parking spaces on site. Um, five of those spaces are for the retail units um, to do as they wish with those spaces. Um, the other five spaces are for the residential units and two of those five are allocated as disabled parking bays. Um, so those five spaces for the residential units will be allocated to five of the apartments and the rest of the apartments are car, car free. Um, but in answer to your question, the retail units will have five spaces, which is deemed acceptable by our highways team. Thank you, That's that sounds reasonable. Thank you very much. So just for clarity, uh, Connie, I note that um, Woodley Town Council um, um, ask that the parking management plan consider some allocated parking spaces for the staff of the retail unit. I'm not exactly sure what allocated meant in this context. Was it allocated to specific retail units or five in total? Um, are you satisfied um, with the arrangement? Yes, so this has um, also been accepted by our highways team and they've deemed the level of parking sufficient um, and have recommended the necessary conditions to ensure that's a suitable amount moving forward, um, such as the parking management plan, just so that in future the parking arrangements will always be clear for whatever retail unit is, is occupying those uh, shops. Thank you, Connie. Stuart? Yeah, I We'd just be absolutely clear as car parking. How much car parking do the retail units have now? And are we saying that that moves to five? Can you please fill us in? So currently the car parking is not formalised. Um, so it, through neighbouring comments, it's been um, suggested that sort of up to 18 cars are parking in there at any one time, but there's not defined bays. So it's a bit... Um, a bit hodgepodge. Um, so that this introduces a more formalised arrangement and the amount of spaces that will be formalised are considered acceptable by highways. So because of the informal situation at the moment, there is a there is a reduction, but those spaces are not are not formal at the moment. If, you, if you're staff of the retail units, there's 18 of you and there's only five of you can park a car and that's a big problem. I mean, that's like taking away two thirds of the car parking. So I can see this is it's not exactly business friendly, is it, to those retail units? Um, 
I suppose in response, the the site is in a highly sustainable location with public car parks in the vicinity and also lots of bus stops around. Um, so the the level in um, car parking for the retail units was was accepted at five spaces owing to that. But not by the retail units, by by highways. Yeah, I mean, they, I, I didn't know that highways. So our high. Our highways team have accepted that level of parking for the retail units. Um, the applicant has submitted this application. Um, they they have submitted the application indicating they own all the land within the red line. So it would be down to them whether they they would have control over those retail units. Um, I'm unsure of the exact owner arrangements of the site. Um, but they have control over that land, so would be able to dictate the parking as they choose. Well, it doesn't sound very friendly to our business businesses in Rudley, does it? I, I think it's going to be wholly unacceptable to them when they find out. And okay, would anyone else like to probe on this issue of parking? No? Okay, on another matter, Wayne? Yes. Can you just remind me? Who comes up with the calculation of 166,000 versus 2.8 units? And the other question I have is on page 373, bullet 35, um, it states that the um, on-site contribution would result in a mix, mix of tenure in the flatted block. The only practical means of delivery of affordable housing is through a commuted sum. Now, I didn't, I've not seen that before. And I know we have built flats in the borough where they have mixed tenure. And because the point I'm really making is, how can you get 2.8 on 166? You can't, you can't build a flat for 166. Well, a developer might, but you couldn't buy it for that. So we've got 166. We won't be able to buy one unit for that. So my question is, where has that comment come from and who has calculated the one six? I, I'm not, I know it's not you, Connie, but I want to know who has calculated that figure. Um, so these figures are provided by our affordable housing team. Um, so that they have um, provided that financial contribution, have worked that out. Um, in our affordable housing SPD schemes that... Um, I think it's four units so if if a, a site were to have less than four affordable units it's more practical to get a financial contribution in instead of an on-site provision um as as a small number of units is typically not that attractive to an rp um so a financial contribution is sought in lieu of that um and that was calculated at the 166,000 by that officer but you get my point members <laughs> 166,000, what does that get you in Woodley? Uh, you know, and I know we've got examples in your war, Tony, where we've had issues in the past where there's mixed tenure. So I don't know where that statement has come from. Perhaps this is something that um, uh, members might like to follow up through other channels because, you know, I think it's a very important point. I would like because we had we brought the Sonning application back to this committee three mm. times, I think it was in the end. Mm. Mm. Um, and we we kind of said to ourselves, we need to do something about this. Indeed. And I think we need to see sight of how this calculation is made up. Because it's, it don't equate to 2.8. It would barely equate to one. Yeah. Um, Brian, would you like to comment at all on that? Um, and then I'd perhaps like to make a comment. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Wayne. Um, it's a... Uh, it's it's a it's a good question. Um, the first thing I'd probably say is that without going into the long grass of affordable housing and viability, the local plan allows us as an authority to either secure on-site or off-site affordable housing contribution. And in many cases, off-site is 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 pulled pulled financial contribution the council uses to purchase off-the-peg affordable units. However, the 
amount of money, so the 160 that you're looking at, is not directly transferable. So it's not uh, it's not based on the cost, the price of a market unit in a certain location. It's based on a percentage of the value of an affordable unit. And so it's not the equivalent of the council for in this case 180 divided by two is 80 grand using 80 grand to go and buy it's pulled together to have a greater purchasing power there's lots of calculations that go behind it and again it's probably not the place to go into the method of calculation that our affordable housing team use nor the spd or local plan policy which in in, in the not too distant future will be uh updated and reviewed um so it is a it is an interesting and it is a good question um but the uh, mechanism for which a developer can decide to provide on-site or off-site is clearly signposted in policy and has been for many many years um the uh, point that connie helpfully made about whether a small number of affordable units provided on-site would be attractive for a registered provider is a very important point if we are looking at 2.8 units, let's assume the developer is willing to provide two or three units on site among a very small development in this location on its own. It would be impractical, unviable for them to take and manage them such a small number. That's why councils and registered providers tend to be attracted to larger developments, purpose built clusters, which they can manage um and are designed to their specifications um larger developments as as you know is commonplace in in uh, adjoining boroughs for example larger flatted developments it is viable to provide 20 30 40 affordable flats in a 100 200 house scheme um but that's not the situation we're in with with small kind of additional floors on buildings in woodley all right i get that and i accept that but this is a very sustainable site compared to say putting 200 affordable houses in the MOD at Arborfield. So it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. All I was saying that I think this committee needs to go into a bit more detail, not tonight, offline, because this will, I will keep bringing it up and because, you know, it breaks with me because it's not 2.8, it's not even one. Yeah, I understand your concern, Wayne, and I think this is something which we should pursue outside of the meeting. I think, though, that the fact that this calculation has been made by our... Of, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, the, but the fact that this calculation has been done by our affordable housing team um, uh, would make it very, very uh, difficult um, uh, for uh, that or concerns about the the calculation to be a reason for given as the reason a reason for refusal. Tony. Thank you. Are there any other members of the committee who would like to to ask any questions or make any comments? Before we go to uh, before we see whether there's anyone who'd like to make a um, a, a proposal. Um, I'd like to echo uh, something that Tony uh, suggests uh, said, um, um, uh, and I support um, uh, Tony's observation that to me this seems to be a very good example um, of WBC and an applicant working together to produce a proposal designed to address uh, the specific reasons that were given for an earlier refusal, and um, I would like that um, uh, to be uh, to be minuted. Um, would somebody like to make a proposal? Al? Okay, I'd like to propose that we um, accept the author's recommendation. Okay, so that's the recommendation as outlined on page 363. Okay, do we have a seconder? I'll second that, Tony. Thank you. All of those in favour um, of approving this application, please raise your hands. Okay. Um, uh, those who are um, against and those who are abstaining, there's three abstentions. Thank you very much. Uh, so this application has been approved. Thank you.
Uh, we'll take a, does anybody else need a short comfort break? Okay. Excuse me. Thank you. OK, so agenda item 10, um, application 230283, Oak Apples, and the case officer is Marcus. Over to you, Marcus. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, all. This is application number 230283 for the proposed erection of six attached dwellings with associated landscaping, parking and means of access following the demolition of the existing dwelling on the site known as Oak Apples off Oaklands Lane within the settlement of Crowthorn. This application follows a series of applications relating to the site, with the most relevant being planning permission granted in 2022 for the erection of four larger detached dwellings with a similar layout to the current proposal. Um, firstly, just to update members, the supplementary update agenda for this meeting includes advice from the Council's Ecology Officer. If they have raised no objections to the scheme, subject to conditions relating to on-site biodiversity mitigation and enhancement measures, measures being carried out in accordance with the relevant submitted documents, as well as an off-site biodiversity net gain contribution being secured by the associated Section 106 agreement. Two additional conditions. In line with the officer's comments have been added to the list of conditions included in Appendix 1, the committee report, and also the head of terms of the Section 106 agreement has also been updated in line with their comments. Uh, there has also been an amendment to the first informative appended to the committee report. Sorry, just been a bit slow. The application site currently consists of a derelict single detached dwelling which is positioned centrally within 0.63 hectares of land on the southern side of Oaklands Lane. The site falls within a modest development location as, as designated by the local development plan. The site is occupied by mature trees towards its boundaries which are protected by woodland tree preservation order. To the north of the site is Hatchride Primary School and its playing fields. The west, east and south of the site is suburban in character and appearance, largely consisting of 1960s residential development. Nine dwellings were recently constructed immediately to the south of the application site after planning permission was granted in 2016.
Um, the principle of residential development on the site has already been established under uh, Sorry, it's um, not sure what's going on. We'll keep it there. Um, the principle of residential development on the site has already been established under the original approval for four dwellings. Therefore, the assessment required for this application has focused on whether two additional dwellings on the site would be unacceptable. Um, the layout is largely unchanged from the previous approval and is respective of the woodland character of the site. Despite two additional dwellings being proposed, the cumulative footprint of the proposal is only slightly larger than was already been approved, um, 795 square metres compared to 715. Um, this is largely due to the reduction in size and bulk of the dwellings, with four bedroom dwellings proposed instead of five. The size of the dwellings is also more in keeping with the surrounding streets and the density of the proposed development is lower than the wider established neighbourhood, which is in excess of 20 dwellings per hectare. The proposed dwelling mix is also more appropriate in an area predominated by family size, three and four bedroom dwellings. Um, therefore, the proposal is not viewed as an overdevelopment of the site. Um, this, um, this slide, if it comes up, shows uh, street scene elevations, which helps contextualise the proposed development. The proposed dwellings would be well set back from Oaklands Lane and would not dominate the street scene. Um, the pink and yellow outline show the approved scheme. The proposed dwellings are of a smaller bulk, which is clearly evident with, with their reduced ridge line and width. The proposed dwellings vary in design, which promotes the attractiveness of the scheme, while their consistent scale and hip roof forms ensure that they tie in together. Um, the incorporation of front gardens with additional tree parting would further soften the visual impact of the scheme and ensure that it relates well and does not introduce adverse harm to the character of the area. The improvements to the proposal compared to the original, original approval are well highlighted by comparing plot one under this scheme and the approved. The proposed dwelling is of a smaller scale, more attractive design and has a more efficient layout internally. While the proposal includes two additional dwellings on the site, Compared to what has already been approved to the site, its design, bulk and scale ensures that the development of the site will retain an acceptable impact on the character of the area with no adverse harm to the surrounding woodland. Um, this proposal seeks to utilise and widen the existing access onto Oaklands Lane, while within the site a five metre wide access road and turning point ahead will be constructed. Oaklands Lane is a single track byway. Um, the highways officers at council have raised no objection to the proposed access being utilising the existing byway and that remains the case for this proposal. Uh, traffic restrictions have recently been installed on Oakland Lane to the east, preventing through traffic coming from the junction with new Wokingham Road and significantly reducing vehicle movements on the lane. In terms of additional trip movements to and from the site as a result of the two additional dwellings, this would likely mean one extra movement each hour in peak periods, which is a very small increase in movement compared to what has already been agreed as an acceptable impact on the highway network, and no objection has been raised on highway safety grounds. Um, to conclude, the proposal is within a sustainable location and of an appropriate scale in relation to its surroundings, with noted improvements compared to the previous approval. When assessing the provision of two additional dwellings on the site and applying weight to the tilted balance, no adverse harm has been identified, which would significantly or adversely outweigh the benefits of the scheme. Um, this application is therefore recommended for approval, subject to conditions in form is listed, as well as the completion of a Section 106 legal, legal agreement relating to matters including woodland management, affordable housing and off-site biodiversity contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Um, we have two registered speakers. The first is Stuart Shafran. I believe that you are online, Stuart. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Uh, Thank yeah. you. Uh, would we be able to stop sharing the scheme? Thank you. When you're ready, Stuart. OK, um, I'll start now. Firstly, it's important to note that this site is designated woodland, uh, with a woodland TPO covering the entire site which was supposedly meant to protect the site from development. But now we have yet another very unpopular and totally inappropriate application for development, this time for six houses. 
I have four main concerns with this application, which also apply to the previous application for four houses, which should never have been approved. One, the only access is via a single lane byway right next to a school. This byway is heavily used by pedestrians as a shortcut to the Greenwood Road shops from Hatch Ride and all the surrounding roads. School children are dropped off at the rear entrance to the school, which is on the byway. There is a history of near misses with cars, and there is considerable risk to school children. The byway is not a suitable access point for this housing scheme. Two, the site is located directly opposite a school, very close to the main school building. Any development work will have a significant impact on pupils in terms of noise and dust. And yet there is no mention of the close proximity to the school in any of the reports, nor is there any management plan in place to mitigate effects on school pupils, some of whom may be allergic to or disturbed by the dust or noise generated. Three, the biodiversity net gain in the ecology report is only valid if the remaining woodland remains as woodland and is managed properly. The woodland ceases to be woodland if it is converted into six private gardens. The woodland management plan cannot possibly be applied to privately owned gardens. This proposal goes completely against government policies for net biodiversity gain, especially with the use of biodiversity offsetting or mitigation, which according to the government guidelines should have only been used in exceptional circumstances and as a last resort. Uh, number four is Parking for residents and visitors on this site will be a major problem. Um, with only three parking spaces allocated for four bedroom house and no provision for visitors, it's obvious that cars will end up being parked along the byway, which will cause traffic problems and even more risk to pedestrians. The number of cars per household is always more than what is planned for. Uh, there's been no proper impact assessment carried out to address any of these issues. The last proper ecological survey carried out was many years ago, and there was no proper highway safety report for either this application or the previous one. The argument for approval seems to be based on the fact this is just another two additional houses, but the previous application should not have been approved due to the issues I've already stated. Any additional houses are just going to compound the problems. What we really need here is a more suitable scheme for one or at most two houses to replace the existing house, while still retaining all of the surrounding woodland. This would be the most sensible and obvious solution. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, uh, Stuart. Um, Stephen Brown, okay. Um, if you'd like to come to the front, please, thank you. The agent, representing the agent, or sorry, the agent. Good evening, Chair, members. I'd just like to start by thanking Mr Watts for his comprehensive report and your presentation, which indeed eloquently sets out the merits of this scheme in the context of the prevailing planning policy considerations. Um, for a site of this size within the defined settlement limits, it has a disproportionately long planning history. The grant of planning permission this evening will bring an end to that saga and secure the delivery of six much needed high quality family homes in a verdant setting that respects the character of the area, including the root protection areas of mature trees, the ecology buffers, the amenity of neighbouring properties, as well as the visual amenity enjoyed along Oakland's Lane. Although the principle of redeveloping the site for housing has already been established, as you've heard, through the extant planning permission for four dwellings, the sixth dwelling scheme before you this evening will make more efficient use of the site resulting in smaller dwellings, lower ridge heights than those currently approved, and built form almost entirely located within the footprint of the approved dwellings. The applicant is Palantine Homes, a privately owned development company that specialises in the construction of high quality bespoke schemes such as this. They now own the site, having purchased it from the previous applicant, Goldfinch Estates, and they are indeed eager to implement the scheme if granted this evening. The application result is the result of an extensive and collaborative approach to placemaking and a thorough review of all that has gone before. And as set out in your report, there are no technical objections to this scheme from any of the statutory consultees, including importantly, highways. So this is exactly the type of high quality development encouraged by the framework 
the council's own policies are set out in the core strategy, the managing development delivery DPD, the design guidance, and indeed the Crowthorn Village design statement. Um, I, I note the references set out in the parish council's submissions and Councillor Helia Simmons expressed in relation to vehicle traffic, etc. All of these matters have been comprehensively addressed in the officer's report. Um, so overall, this scheme will result in a high quality development that will, will uh, provide a good quality architecturally designed scheme. It will finally result in the redevelopment of a redundant, dilapidated site in a sustainable location that has sadly become a target for antisocial behaviour, policy compliant for contribution towards affordable housing, appropriate levels of parking, as you've heard, electric vehicle charging points, retention of boundary trees, ecology buffers, and indeed a layout that respects the character of the area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Right, um, could members who'd wish to ask questions or make comments please indicate? Anyone like to ask any questions? Just while you're thinking, okay. Um, I think it's, um, well, firstly, I'd like to just reinforce that the, so the supplementary agenda does include extracts from the council's ecology officer who raised no um, objections subject to conditions. And there's a proposal for two additional conditions uh, in the supplementary agenda. agenda. Um, and there's also a correction um, to the informative on page 434 uh, regarding off-site um, biodiversity net gain. So if we can make sure that we've all um, noted and understood that. Um, it was very clearly explained, um, uh, I think, by Marcus, uh, that the principle of development um, was established in October um, of 2022, um, granting conditional approval for four dwellings. So this committee therefore needs to focus on the impacts, if any, that the addition of two more homes on site might have. And I think we should take um, uh, of the uh, uh, the differences uh, in design um, in, of the homes um, in this new application compared with the um, original application. So I just those, throw those um, thoughts out there uh, for members to consider. Are there now any members who would like to ask officers any questions? Al, thank you. Just, just ask, I mean, in 2022, this, it didn't come to this committee, did it? So it was, no one called it in then. So so, so something, so the difference between four and six has, has provoked a change in um, the local member, the ward member to bring this in, but she didn't call it in when there was only four. Marcus? Um, yeah, that's correct. So um, as the planning history shows um, on page uh, 412, um, there have been a series of applications for the site. Um, none of them have come to committee before. So this is the first application that's been listed to committee. Wayne? Um, Marcus, could you just explain the resident was talking about this woodland preservation order? Um, how many trees would be lost in the woodland preservation order? in order to facilitate this development? Because they normally list them, don't they? You know, you know it's a collective of, of species and... Um... Yes, yeah, so um, with this site, um, there's a woodland tree preservation order, yeah. order covering every single tree on site. Yeah. Um, under this proposal, only three are to be removed and they are either dead or in declining health. Um, so those are the only reasons why the trees and the landscape team of the council are happy for them to be removed. And I would also note that there are, to mitigate that loss, there are more, many more than three trees proposed as additional planting on the boundaries of the site. So that's uh, compensating for that loss, I would say. Thank you. Would you like to probe that further? No. Any other questions? Do we have a member who would like to make a proposal? 
Um, I would. Uh, I propose that the committee approve the officer recommendation as outlined on page 411 with the additional conditions um, and correction to an informative described in the supplementary agenda. Do we have a seconder? Al? OK, all of those um, in favour um, of this proposal, please raise your hands. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. OK, so this application is approved. Thank you. That formal meeting to the end now. Yeah, so that brings the um, the formal meeting to an end. Thank you, everybody, for your participation um, this evening.